I did that. We were sending out this tape. This is kind of dated. We were sending out cassette tapes. And uh, what I found out, what I realized, is I got some messages or emails from people that said, Brother Steve, when you make a reference to something, a lot of times, you apparently you're just pointing at a board because you'll say over here and in this period, and it said, we don't have a clue. Listen to these tapes, what you're talking about. And because of that, I stopped using it because then I had to explain. And uh, we had a, a pretty large tape ministry at the time. And uh, so I stopped using the, the whiteboard, which I like to use it. But today, I want to use it because of uh, some specific verses that we're going to talk about, and particularly a pattern that these verses show us in the Bible. Now, last Sunday morning, uh, we did the first message of what I think will be a two-part message, or maybe one more uh, that we do uh, concerning judgment in general. But last week, we talked primarily about hell and the reality of hell. And I mentioned during that message in the introduction of that message that there's a lot of people that uh, don't believe in hell. Uh, there are grace preachers who, uh, particularly those that, that take the Acts 28 position that do not believe in hell. And the reasons they say for that is because Paul never mentions hell. And so we're going to talk about that today. Uh, another thing I mentioned was is that I rarely ever teach on hell, probably not nearly as often as I should, because it is real. And that was kind of borne out by the comments I got during the week. And I had at least, I'd say, five or six comments from people, uh, Facebook Messenger and also emails, about the fact that grace preachers no longer preach on hell. Well, I know that's not true. That's not a, you know, a... Uh, Sweet, that's kind of a sweeping statement, but you do rare, I mean, rarely do you hear grace preachers preach on hell because we like to take the other side and talk about the grace of God and His love and His mercy and, and all of that. And uh, so there is a hesitancy sometimes to talk about something as horrible as hell. And there are grace preachers that have moved all the way across the spectrum. Not only do they not believe in hell, uh, they believe that uh, in universal salvation, that is, they believe that everybody is going to be saved in the very in the end. Uh, Brother uh, Paul Skates gave me a book that he had ordered from a gentleman out up in Connecticut that uh, taught the grace message for 20-something years, and now he's teaching universal salvation. Uh, been looking through that book, and I meant to bring it this morning to read some excerpts, but as usual, I forgot it, and so I don't have it with me. But uh, I do want to finish, I want to finish the message that we started last week on the reality of hell. Now, I'm not going to have you turn to these verses, but uh, I just want to mention to you that... The verses we looked at, there were several facts that you can establish. Number one, hell is a place of fire. Uh, in Matthew 5, 22, the fool shall be in danger. Thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Matthew 19, 8, 18, 9, if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Uh, Mark 9, 47. Uh, same, basically the same verse. Mentions being cast into hell fire. So we know that hell is a place of fire. Uh, thus the phrase, hell fire. Also, it's a place of torment. According to Luke 16. And again, those that uh, don't preach hell or believe in hell, teach Luke 16 as a parable. I preach it as an actual account by the Lord. And in Luke 16, uh, the Bible said, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes, uh, seeing Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. Uh, 
We saw in Matthew 23, it's a place of damnation. In Matthew 25, verse 46, it's a place of punishment. According to Psalms 18, 5, it's a place of sorrow. Uh, in Psalms 9, 17, it's a place for the wicked. Uh, and in Proverbs 27, 20, uh, the Bible says that hell was enlarged. It has limitless space. And so I believe it is a literal, physical place where all the lost of all ages will end up in the lake of fire, uh, hell included. And so what I wanted to establish today is why is it, why, in other words, why would a God of love and mercy and kindness send people to hell or allow people to go to hell? Well, I want you to go back to Exodus chapter 34. And there's a couple of things I want to establish before uh, I explain why Paul never mentioned hell. Uh, and that is a question that comes up among people. But in Exodus chapter 34, In Exodus 34, verse 6, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and it will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Now that verse shows us a contrast. It shows us, number one, that even under the law, the Lord God was looked at as merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, and transgression of sins. Now a lot of times that's where people end when they quote the verse or read the verse. But the next words are, and that by and that will by no means clear the guilty. So we move from the goodness of God, the graciousness of God, to the fact that God is one day going to hold the guilty accountable. And he is going to be, he, he is the judge of all mankind. Uh, I believe that the righteousness of God requires him to be just. And so under every program that God established, whether it be in the Garden of Eden, was there judgment there? Yes, there was. What was the punishment? They were cast out of the garden. We all suffer from that, even today. Then in Genesis chapter 6, God looked down, saw the imaginations of the thoughts and the heart of man, that it was only evil continually. Did God bring judgment? Yes, He did. He brought it with a flood, destroyed all mankind. Think about this. People that, that, that deny that God is going to punish the wicked, what are they going to do with, like, the flood? Where God destroyed all of mankind. Well, according to them, all those people that died in the flood, they're going to be saved too. No scripture to bear that out. Look back in Genesis chapter 18, while we're here in the uh, Old Testament, Genesis chapter 18. Look there in verse, the, the context here in Genesis 18, uh, obviously, is, the, is Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, in verse 20, the Lord said, because the city of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it which is coming to me, and if not, I will know 
And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And we know that Abraham intercedes for the city. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? For adventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, and be far from thee. Now notice, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? I hope you're looking at, the, at your verse in the Bible because it's interesting that the word judge there, right in the middle of the sentence, is capitalized. Now, most of the time when the judgment's spoken of, it's just a small J. But it's speaking about the judge of all the earth. That would be God. God is just. God is right. There is no iniquity in Him. God is not a man that he can lie. He is just and he is the judge of all the earth to do what? To do right. So to question God's judgment is to question the very nature of God himself and his attribute of holiness. God is just. God is a judge. Look over in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. 35. The verse says, To me the law of vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people, and repent himself of his servants when he seeth that their power is gone, and that there is none shut up or left. Uh, in Joshua 24, we won't turn there, the Bible says, Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God, He is a jealous God, He will not forgive your transgressions, nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then He will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that He has done you good. So the Bible is clear from the very beginning that God was a God of mercy, loving kindness, long-suffering, grace, and so forth, but He was also a God of judgment, a God of justice. And in Zechariah, or Zephaniah 1 verse 8, the Bible says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy evidence of all them that dwell in the land. Now most all those verses that we've read have to do with God's judgment to Israel, or over Israel. But that judgment was not limited to Israel. And the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of himself as the judge, as a judge. And notice what Paul says in Acts chapter 17. In Acts 17, in Acts 17, of course, it's the account there, when you get over to verse 18, the account is of the city of Athens. And in verse 18 it says, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, 
He seemeth to be a sinner forth of strange gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. So Paul is preaching Christ. He's preaching the fact that Jesus Christ was proved to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. And in verse 23 it says, As I passed by, and behold your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. People today ignorantly worship. When people worship God in any way, apart from that which is indicated by the scriptures, they're doing it through ignorance generally. And so Paul said in verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. How many times have you ever heard people talk about going down to God's house? Let me tell you something, folks. This isn't God's house here. You know where God's house is? In here. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Neither is worship, verse 25, neither is worshiped with men's hands as though he needeth anything, as in, now we're going to worship God with our tithes and offerings. Worshiping God is not bringing tithes and offerings. The word worship, when you think about it, if you break it down, it's like worship. It's acknowledging. The way you worship God is to acknowledge His worth. The way you worship Jesus Christ is to acknowledge the worth of His death, burial, and resurrection. When we talk about worshiping God, it's not a matter of putting your hands up in the air and shouting and saying, not that there's anything wrong with shouting and singing and putting your hands up, but that's not worship. Worship is proclaiming the truth about all that God has done and is doing through His Son, Jesus Christ, and will do in the future. Yeah. It's giving Him His due worship. And the Bible says in verse 25, He is not worth with men's hands as though He needeth anything. I mean, listen folks, how many times have you seen or heard where they're building huge buildings to the glory of God. He's not worshiping man's hands. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need what we have to offer. Now he wants us to serve him. He says we're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God. Your body and your spirit with your ears. But he doesn't need us. We need him. Amen. We need him. He's made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and determine the, the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord if happily they may feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of our own poets have said, for we are not his. We are. I'm sorry. For we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God weeped at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So what's Paul doing preaching repentance? Well, folks, there's a lot of misunderstanding about repentance. I hear see people all the time, salvation has nothing to do with repentance. I would submit to you that when you look at the word for what it actually means, that nobody ever got saved without repenting. Because repentance is a change of mind. And at some point in your life, you had to change your mind from believing that there was somehow something you could do in your flesh to get saved and trust in Jesus Christ. That's repentance. 
to have a change of mind. So Paul calls What's Paul calling these people? He says, you see, every time the, the word repentance, like, like when John preached the baptism of repentance, what did he say? Think not to say. Repentance is always associated with what is thought. And so what does Paul say here? He said, in him we live and move. And he says, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think. He's telling these people, you need to change your thinking about who God is. He's not, the, the Godhead is not like unto gold or silver or stone, regular bar or man's device. And the times of this sickness God winked at, but now He commanded all men everywhere to repent because, notice now, He has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. That one man, folks, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the only one that is worthy of our worship and our admiration and our appreciation. So, the point I want you to see there is that Paul, no doubt, preaches judgment. Uh, if you look over in... Uh, uh, Romans chapter 1, he mentions there about those in time past. In Romans chapter 1, he talks about uh, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God and so forth. But back up in verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Part is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, wherein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. How is the righteousness of God displayed through the gospel? Well, Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He faced again the third day, according to the Scripture. And so we have this hope of eternal life because of what Jesus did. The righteousness of God. A person could, be, could say, well listen, God is not righteous because I was born in sin and I didn't have anything to do with that. Therefore God would be unrighteous to send me to hell for my sin. No, He wouldn't because He provided a way for you not to go to hell through His Son Jesus Christ. So the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. Not only that. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. You see, I believe the wrath of God is displayed through the gospel. How is that? Christ died for our sins. The Bible said God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus Christ, when he hung on that cross, he took our wrath. He took our punishment. He took our sin upon him to the extent that God turned his back on him. And Christ cried out on that cross, God be merciful. Or, 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 or God, he said, my Lord, my Lord, why have thou forsaken me? And he died. He died for our sins. The wrath of God is revealed by the cross of Christ. Now think about this, folks. Come on. If God would pour out his wrath on his own son, what would he do to a person who in their arrogance and pride say that they didn't need what he did. Well, that's what religious people and people in the world do all the time. We, who needs Jesus? They mock him. They make light of him. They deny that he was God manifest in the flesh. 
And as Brother Brian Sykes so put it so well, when he said, people talk about God will never send somebody to hell. <laughs> he said, if you reject his son, who he put through hell, not only will he send, allow you to go to hell, he'll stick you in hell and you'll fry like a sausage ball. Now, that doesn't make us happy. I'm not glad. I, I wish that what these guys are teaching about uh, universal salvation is true. I wish that everybody was going to be saved again. But they're not. Because God provided a way. And for God to change what He has written down in His Word or proclaimed to be true, He would be a liar. And the whole thing would be of no value. So, the Apostle Paul preached judgment. We'll look at some of these verses more closely. In 1 Thessalonians 1 10, he says, We're waiting for a son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which <coughs> delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, the reason that I, that I, I believe that Paul never mentioned hell in his epistles was there was no need to. Uh, what I put on the board up here, and I don't usually use the board because of the video and so forth, and uh, I hope that, well, it's gotten turned a little bit or something. Uh, put it this way. See, so we got two cameras, and if I get it on Facebook, then Billy can't see it, the camera can't see it. We're going to remedy that. But I wanted to put these verses up here, so if you want to jot that. And the people watching over the internet probably may not even be able to see this. But what these verses demonstrate, turn to Matthew chapter 18. What these verses demonstrate is that most of the time when judgment is mentioned, it's mentioned in correlation to the opposite of judgment. Uh, and, and so I went through all these, I, I found all these verses that I, it just kind of, kind of fascinate me that in all these verses they mention life and then they mention judgment. For example, Matthew 18, verse 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut him off and cast him from thee, it is better for thee to enter into what? Life, halt or maim, rather than having two hands or two feet, to be cast into everlasting fire. Enter into life, everlasting life. Uh, look in Matthew 25. We read, I quoted some of these verses, I read some of these verses a minute ago. Look at Matthew 25. This is the judgment of the Gentile nations in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. And so, I'm not going to take time to read all of that. But at the end of the whole thing, those that did not help the Lord's people he said, verse 46, And these shall go away into what? Everlasting punishment. Everlasting punishment. Don't misspell it. But the righteous into what? Life eternal. There's life again. Look over in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3. John 3, 12. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, 
but have their eternal life. So, there's eternal life. Those that don't have eternal life, what? <coughs> perish. They perish. Look in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, He gave the only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here, eternal life. Here, everlasting life. Look in John chapter 4, 5. In John 5. John 5 in verse uh, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath what? Everlasting life. And shall not come into what? Condemnation. But is passed from death unto life. So you've got eternal life, you've got condemnation, you've got death. Now look over in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5. In Romans 5, back in verse 12, Paul said, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You get down to verse, uh, well, this, we're going to skip all the way down to verse 20. Moreover, the law entered, that the offense might abound, or where sin abounded, Grace did much more abound. Throughout the chapter there, Paul's talking about the gift of righteousness. And he's showing how that God was just in punishing people in Adam if they didn't trust in Jesus Christ and receive that gift of righteousness. But notice in verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, now, when Paul talks about death in his epistles, much of the time it's not about simply killing over and being dead in the physical body. It's eternal death. And we'll see that in a minute. That a sin hath reigned unto death. You see, back there in verse 12. Wherefore by one man sin into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Death has had to reign. What did God tell Adam and Eve? The day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt what? Surely die. Did they die physically? No, they died spiritually. They suffered for that which they did. He said, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have this sentence of death upon us. We're born with that. How does it... How do we be relieved of that? Well, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He said, even as death is reigned, even so might grace reign. Grace reigns today. Particularly in the life of those that trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Now look in chapter 6. Very famous verse. It's used in soul winning and tracts and stuff. Paul says in verse 23, For the wages of sin is death. Now again, that's not just necessarily physical death. I mean, how many of y'all in here sin on a regular basis? We only have three so far that make your hands. And wouldn't you know it, I could have picked them out. <laughs> Every one of them don't have a hair of head, a hair on their head. <laughs> no, they're just honest. We all sin, but we're still alive. But there's a death, folks, that people suffer that do not trust Jesus Christ as their Savior that we don't suffer. It's the death. It, it's the death of. Eternal separation from God Almighty. And the wages of sin is that death. 
and out of all die. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. Uh, back in Romans chapter 1, In verse, well, it's hard to cut in here because back at start back in verse 24, it says God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their hearts. And he names all of these things. He talks about sexual perversion, sin in general. He talks about in verse 30, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. Implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, and not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Well, I believe you could just very easily not change the verse at all, but it would be right to say that they're worthy of hell. They're worthy of eternal judgment. They're worthy of death. Why? Because they rejected the grace of God and what God provided for man to be made righteous. So, in Romans chapter 8, look at Romans 8. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. Now, I probably need to go back and do a study on Romans chapter 8 because there's a lot of confusion about it. But in the context, just bear with me, and you may want to check this out or discuss it with me or tell me I'm wrong. But I believe in Romans 8, 6, to be carnally minded is to believe in your mind that there's something in your flesh that you can do to be justified. So to be carnally minded, if that is the case, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Life and peace. Second Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has what? Abolished death. Well, He didn't abolish physical death. We still die physically. But He abolished death and has brought life and immortality to life through the Gospel. So Paul continually uses the contrast of death Separation from God and life, eternal life with God. Now, look over at Revelation chapter 1. And we can see that there was no real need for Paul to mention hell. He mentions death over and over and over again. And Adam all died. In Christ all can be made alive. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of what? Death. death. He has the keys of hell and of death. Look over in Revelation chapter 6. 
in Revelation chapter 6. Notice there in verse 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And this is not tombstone, but this is what the verse was that they quoted in there. Some of y'all will get that. I looked and behold a pale horse, his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. Uh, now over to Revelation chapter 20. We'll wrap this up. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their words. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Now notice, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell, folks. Paul said the wages of sin is death. And at the end time, death and hell are going to be delivered up and they're all and both are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Over in Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Listen, again, none of this makes me happy. None of this makes me glad that people are going to suffer eternal punishment. But it does make me happy and glad that God has provided a way for us to escape. For us to realize that we don't have to spend eternity in hell or the lake of fire because Jesus Christ Paid for all of our sins. And in Christ, we have life and we have life eternal. We have everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The question is have you ever received the gift? I pointed out last week about the gift. He's not going to get another dollar. <laughs> I used the illustration of giving away a dollar. He received it. It became his. That's how simple it is, folks. The gift of salvation is available. You receive it. And it's yours. And the moment you receive it, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And when your body goes to sleep and you die, you're going to be in the presence of God Almighty People say, well, how could you be in the presence of God Almighty and be asleep? Well, you do that every night. <laughs> You're in the presence of your spouse, but you don't know it. It's a reprieve from your spouse for seven or eight hours. <laughs> That's why we call it sleep. That's why they call it rest. And I'm just kidding about that. Folks, the good news is that Jesus paid off Amen. 
All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. What a sad thing it is, is that people today would reject what Jesus Christ did and end up in hell. It's not a happy thought. But it is sh- it, throughout the Bible we are shown that God is righteous in all that he does in all of his judgments. He is the judge. He's the one that... that and Paul asks the question in Romans chapter 8. Who shall know the mind of the Lord? His ways are past understanding. We are simply to believe what the book says. Trust that. And use every opportunity we have to get this glorious gospel out to people. So they too can know the glory of trusting Christ as their Savior. You never trusted Him? Receive Him right now, believing that He died for your sins, was buried, and was raised again for your justification. Would you stand for a prayer? Our Father, we thank you today for this opportunity we've had to study your word. We thank you for your word, for the infallibility of it, for the truth of it. And Lord, though people deny it, people reject it, people resist it, we know that it's true, it's right, and we know that through believing what your son did at Calvary was enough, and receiving the free gift of salvation, that we can be saved eternally and delivered from this terrible place called hell, called death, and we can live eternally with you throughout the ages. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here today. We're dismissed.